going to be talking about the three-phase inverter, which uses three half bridges, or three half of an H bridge, which is, as we've been studying, a high side and low side switch. We have the high side up here with a P-channel device and a uh, and a N-channel device, or NMOS, and the low side. And uh, the way that we connect it is we leave the terminal, the middle point of the terminals, A, B, and C, open. So we have three of these half bridges, and this gives us quite a bit of control to be able to uh, create uh, a square wave pulse across the um, across the load. Now, depending on how we modify or modulate these inputs, it is possible to create a sinusoid across the load um, or to be able to do three-phase power and do it in a sinusoidal way. Um, these are called sine drive, uh, but we're, we're going to focus mostly on square wave um, drive using six-step commutation. So commutation means to revolve the motor, so to commute it uh, across various stages, and there's six stages that we commonly use when we do these types of motor control applications. Um, one of the things that you can use in the lab is a test a test load if you're just trying to work on the timing um, diagrams and, and understanding the direction of the current it's useful to use uh, high impedance or um, high resistance test loads because if you use a real motor and you send weird signals into it uh, the likelihood that you're going to create a problem is very high so it's better to um, observe current behavior uh, when the consequences are low. So anyway, this is what we have. We have three half bridges, and so three high sides, three low sides. There's all sorts of ways of looking at it. Now, uh, for us to use just one step in the commutation cycle, like let's say we're going to go from A to B. So we're going to connect the load from A to B. And here's our test load. It's going to go A, it's going to go through this resistor, and it's going to go down through this resistor. And the reason it's not going to go through C is because this is going to be held off high impedance. Technically these are all three that are connected to each other. So the current isn't going to split as soon as it gets here. This is high impedance, so the charge is going to want to proceed through the 1k resistor. So this would need to be off, and th I could represent it like that. You know, essentially what we're doing is we are saying, okay, look, all of these things are off, and the only things that can be on are these MOSFETs right here. That is one way of doing it, but in when we have a hardware implementation of this, we can't just you know pick it off the board and say, you're no longer allowed to be there. It doesn't quite work that way. So we actually have to signal them off. So what you would do is you put ground here to signal this end channel off, and you put ground here to signal this end channel off. And if you remember, you can't put ground here because that would turn it on. So you want to make sure that you turn it off and match it to whatever the battery is. So now, this has the opportunity to turn on or off depending on what we do. We could pulse with modulate. Most oftentimes, the low side is pulse width modulated unless you use <clears throat> high side and low side uh, topology with end channel devices. So, uh, But for now we're just going to do a single case. So we're going to connect the drive signal here. Sometimes it's helpful to put the anchoring on the right hand side. It allows you to kind of snuggle it up Oops. as well as probably drop it from the top. That way they both can be shown that the signals are going to work that way. And you ground this. Remember, the difference is what makes this turn on. So this is instructed to turn on, and this is instructed to turn on. So what do we expect? We expect 12 volts to appear at the at the battery voltage, because that's our battery, uh, or supply voltage, however it is in your nomenclature for your project. But you have 12 volts. The 12 volts would appear at this terminal, because these ones are off, as we've instructed them to be. Uh, and you have 12 volts. It goes through A, and then it goes through B. So we have the summation of these two resistors is going to be 2k, so we could expect that the current is going to be 12 volts divided by 2k, which is going to give us 6 milliamps. That's what we expect. Let's run it. So here I have the current running on A. I could run it on A or B. It doesn't really matter. So I run, there you go, 6 milliamps. So it runs according to our expectation. Now we can look at the individual currents from a DC perspective. So there's all sorts of stuff going on. But uh, what we're looking for is in the load. So we have our test load here. We have 6 amps going across A, just as we expect it to. We expect the charge to go here, exit through the A terminal, come back down through the resistor, exit through here, and then go straight to, to ground. So this is just one portion or one step in the commutation cycle. The next one would be to go uh, from you go A to B, and then you may go A to C uh, as far as how that works. But um, what you can do you can in microcap is you can create spreadsheets. You don't need to exit the program in order to do that. So I've created a spreadsheet here, and um, I'm not sure why. There we go. Okay, cool. So for the, for the just this one step, 
it's useful sometimes to list out what your voltages are going to do and what your states are going to be and then how you're going to achieve those states which is the voltage so here we have the gate at the high that one's going to be on and then you have gate at low is off gate at high b is off and gate at low b is on it's that one right there the, this one here and so then what's the voltage necessary to do that all right well in, in order to turn a gate at the high side on we need a zero voltage or something that's going to create a difference but at the low side, we, we need to put zero to make sure it turns off. So these are the voltages that you would use to be able to create those states. And understanding the relationship between these two is critical in order for you to understand uh, the, uh, the progression of the commutation. And this is just for one commutation step. So this command signal A to B is the same thing um, for all of these. Now, there's other ways of representing these tables. What you can do is uh, you can put the, as I have here, the rows, you can put them into the columns. Um, and then you can go from there. But I've decided that since we're only doing one, this is the best way to represent it. So anyway, you can have commutation tables that you can put here. Uh, so there's other uses for tables, as in like lookup tables that you can create and then have parts reference into these tables. Um, that's kind of outside the scope of what we're doing for today. But um, this is just the initial of how to understand three-phase inverter topology. And they call it inverter topology because it's very similar to the inverter that you would use in your vehicle. You have a 12-volt uh, DC to AC converter and it converts um, it converts the 12 volts into something that's 120 um, volts AC at maybe 50 or 60 Hertz depending on how you set the device and that allows you to use household electric you know up until the rated current or rated power um, out of that so anyways we're inverting the, the we're inverting the DC to the AC which is still kind of not the best word to use for that but that's that's what the convention is so we're gonna stick with that so hopefully that's helpful to you to help you understand uh, inverters. If you don't get it the first time, or if you have a fuzzy idea, that's kind of the point, is because uh, these structures and topologies take a while to get an intuition for. But if you write up the commutation table and you use test loads in the lab, that will help you uh, improve your understanding and then be able to design with it. So thanks for watching. See you next time.